The F-22 Raptor can hit speeds no other fighter in America can match. But none of that would be possible without the engine buried deep inside it. It's called the F-119. Building this engine isn't simple. It takes heat, pressure, precision, and people who know exactly what they're doing. Before this engine ever takes to the sky, it begins in fire. Not the kind from the afterburner, but from the forge. It all starts with materials that aren't just strong. They're battle-tested. Titanium is chosen for the fan blades and compressor components. Lightweight, insanely strong, and corrosion-resistant. It's what lets the front of the engine spin faster than a rifle round without tearing itself apart. Nickel-based super-alloys handle the turbine's inferno, where temperatures soar beyond 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. These metals don't just survive the heat, they thrive in it, holding their shape under insane stress. Ceramic coatings are sprayed on like armor, forming thermal shields that deflect the inferno. And then there are the composites and high-strength steels, perfect for support housings, ducts, and fasteners, wherever weight must be cut, but strength can't be compromised. These materials arrive at Pratt & Whitney's Middletown, Connecticut plant as raw billets, forged blocks, and precision-milled sheets. Each piece is inspected with microscopic precision, because even the tiniest flaw can mean catastrophic failure at 35,000 feet. If it's not perfect, it's out. What turns a chunk of metal into the core of a jet engine? Heat, pressure, and precision. After carefully selecting and inspecting the raw materials, it's time to forge them into individual components. First, massive billets of titanium and nickel alloys are loaded into industrial furnaces and heated to over 1,800 degrees Fahrenheit. This extreme heat softens the metals just enough for forging, allowing them to be shaped without cracking while still maintaining their internal strength. Next comes the pressure. Hydraulic forging presses slam the red-hot metal into specific forms with up to 50,000 tons of force. Titanium fan blades are forged with perfect curves to slice air at supersonic speeds. Compressor discs and shafts are shaped for spinning at over 10,000 RPM. Turbine discs, made from nickel superalloys, are built to handle searing combustion temperatures. Each part must have an aligned internal grain, just like wood, to resist tearing under stress. That's why they're forged, not cast. For critical parts like turbine blades, the process is even more extreme. Single crystal casting. Molten metal is poured into ceramic molds and slowly cooled to grow a blade from a single metal grain. No boundaries, no failure points. After forging, parts are vacuum cooled to prevent micro cracks. Inspect it again. Only the strongest survive. These aren't just components, they're future-proofed for hypersonic airflow, afterburner fire, and gravitational stress most machines can't dream of. Here's a quick question before we move on. Both the F-22 and F-35 are cutting-edge jets, so why do they use completely different engines? Drop your guesses in the comments below, we'll reveal the answer at the end of the video. These parts aren't finished yet. Forging gives them their core structure and shape. The fine details are what comes next. After forging, each part goes to 5-axis CNC machines. Robotic cutters that move in every direction, shaving metal with micron-level precision. For high-performance components like blisks, a blade and disc combo milled from a single piece of titanium, there's zero room for error. No welds, no bolts. Just pure, unbroken strength that can spin at 10,000 RPM without flinching. Turbine blades, built to survive 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit heat, need cooling channels drilled by industrial lasers. Some of these holes are smaller than a grain of salt, but absolutely critical. Without them, the metal melts. And when regular drills give up, EDM, electrical discharge machining, takes over. It doesn't cut with a blade, it cuts with controlled sparks, literally vaporizing metal with electricity one pulse at a time. Meanwhile, robotic arms switch tools mid-process, grinding, polishing, scanning, all without human hands. Each part is checked, adjusted, checked again. The tolerances is often within 50 microns. That's thinner than a human hair. These aren't just parts. They're sculpted metal masterpieces, built to handle insane speeds, pressure, and fire for thousands of hours without missing a beat. Now that all the major components, fan blades, compressor discs, shafts, and turbine blades are shaped and finished, it's time to finally unite into something greater than the sum of their parts. 
Assembly begins with sub-modules built at specialized stations. Technicians first mount the fan blades into a central hub, locking them into dovetail grooves with microscopic accuracy. These blades form the massive front fan that pulls in over a ton of air every second. Next, compressor discs are stacked along a central shaft, like building a metal spine. Each disc has tiny slots where dozens of stator vanes, which stay still, and rotor blades, which spin, are precisely inserted by hand or robotic arms. Everything has to line up perfectly or the air won't compress right. Even a tiny misalignment can throw the whole engine off balance. Then comes the combustor, a ring where fuel injectors are installed and airflow paths are sealed to contain controlled explosions. Behind it, turbine stages are slotted in. These blades are mounted onto discs, bolted and pinned using special fixtures to ensure they won't shift under thousands of degrees and intense rotational forces. The F-119 engine core is built around a central shaft, like a spine, torqued down with precision and laser aligned to avoid even the slightest vibration. This core includes the compressor, combustor, and turbines, all perfectly balanced around that spine. And up front, there's no fancy gearbox here, unlike geared turbofan engines. The F-119 is built for raw power and instant response. It's optimized for stealth and speed, letting the F-22 Raptor cruise faster than sound without using afterburners. That's super cruise. With the core modules built and aligned, the fan, compressor, combustor, and turbines, it's time to turn this mechanical marvel into a living engine. Now come the final touches. Technicians bolt on the outer casing, attach fuel lines, hydraulic systems, oil pumps, and the FADEC, the digital brain that controls everything. After final checks, the engine is hoisted into a special test cell, a soundproof, blast-proof room designed to handle 35,000 pounds of raw thrust. Everything is double-checked, airflow paths, fuel pressure, oil levels, and control responses. Then ignition. The engine hums to life, low and steady at first. Then to full military power, vibration, pressure, heat, noise. Data pours in from hundreds of sensors. Engineers watch for any sign of imbalance, fuel irregularities, temperature spikes, because if anything's off, it fails. Failure here means teardown, inspection, maybe a full rebuild. Only if it passes every trial with surgical precision is it certified for flight. That's when it leaves the test stand and heads to the Lockheed Martin assembly line in Marietta, Georgia, where the F-22 Raptor is built. There, the F-119 is carefully lowered into the Raptor's twin engine bay and locked in with surgical precision. Once installed, it's not just a machine anymore, it's the heart of a fifth generation fighter. With testing complete and the engine now roaring to life inside a real Raptor, you'd think the story ends here. But to understand what makes the F-119 so different, we've got to rewind. But first, let's go back to where the F-119 really began. Back in the late 1980s, the US Air Force launched the Advanced Tactical Fighter Program, a contest to create the world's first true stealth air superiority jet. It couldn't just be fast. It had to fly high, avoid radar, and fight in any airspace, all without glowing afterburners giving it away. That meant building a whole new kind of engine, one that could supercruise, one that could hide from radar, one that could vector its thrust mid-flight. Pratt & Whitney stepped up, and the F-119 was the result. Not just powerful, but precise. Not just loud, but lean. The perfect match for the F-22 Raptor. And now, you've seen the journey. From raw metal to whisper-quiet stealth. From a titanium to the soul of a fifth-gen fighter. Remember the question. Both the F-22 and F-35 are cutting-edge jets, so why do they use completely different engines? It's because they were built for totally different missions. The F-22 needed stealth and speed, while the F-35 focused on sensors, range, and vertical takeoff. Picture an engine so fierce it could hurl a 20-ton jet toward the edge of space, yet fragile enough to melt if pushed too far. This is the Tumansky R-15, the raw power behind the MiG-25 Foxbat, the Soviet Union's fastest fighter. The MiG-25 was not designed like any normal fighter. It was born during the height of the Cold War when American spy planes like the SR-71 Blackbird could fly higher and faster than any interceptor. The Soviet Union needed something that could catch it. 
That meant creating a jet that could hit speeds well beyond Mach 2.8 and climb so high it would almost touch the edge of the stratosphere. A conventional jet engine could not handle that kind of punishment. At Mach 3, the air hitting the engine face is already blistering hot, hot enough to weaken most metals before the turbine even lights. The afterburner would be dealing with exhaust close to the temperature of molten lava. So, Soviet engineers did not try to make something refined. They went for sheer brute force. They wanted an engine that could survive a few minutes of unbelievable heat and stress, even if it meant replacing it often. The result was the Tumansky R-15. It was big, heavy, thirsty, and loud. But it could push a 20-ton interceptor past Mach 3 in level flight if the pilot was willing to risk it. But a design on paper is only the beginning. To build a jet that could break the rules of speed, they had to choose the right materials. Unlike the SR-71 Blackbird, which was made mostly from titanium, the MiG-25 was almost entirely stainless steel. It was not because steel was better, but because the Soviet Union simply did not have enough titanium production capacity at the time. The R-15 engine followed the same approach. Its compressor and turbine stages were built from heat-resistant stainless steel and basic nickel alloys, with only small amounts of titanium in the cooler parts. This made the engine heavier than it could have been, but it was much cheaper and easier to build in large numbers. Even the MiG's massive air intakes were built from steel plates with sharp, knife-like edges. Inside were moving ramps that slowed down the supersonic airflow before it hit the engine face. That meant the R-15 did not have to handle completely chaotic shockwaves at Mach 3, but the air entering it was still hundreds of degrees hot even before combustion. To cope, the turbine blades were made from a simple nickel-chrome alloy and coated with a basic thermal barrier. They were designed to take the punishment just long enough. No exotic single crystal ceramics, no complex cooling channels. It was designed to be rugged and easy to replace rather than indestructible. Here's a quick question for you. At full throttle, how much fuel do you think the MiG-25 burned in just one hour? Take your best guess and leave it in the comments. We will reveal the answer just before the outro. Now with the materials ready, it was time to shape them into a machine that could survive Mach 3. At the heart of the R-15 sat an 11-stage axial compressor. Each stage had a ring of large steel blades that squeezed the incoming air tighter and tighter until it reached 11 times atmospheric pressure. The blades were forged from solid billets of steel and nickel alloy, then machined and polished. They were not sculpted to the microscopic perfection of Western jet engines, but they were good enough to do the job. Behind the compressor sat the turbine section with two main stages. The turbine blades were cast in simple molds, heat treated to survive up to 1,832 degrees Fahrenheit and mounted on a long central shaft that ran the full length of the engine. Here was the catch. At Mach 3, the turbine inlet temperature could spike well beyond that limit. Western engines would have used advanced cooling systems to protect the blades. The Soviets simply accepted that the blades would warp and stretch if pushed too far. If the pilot stayed above Mach 3 for too long, the engine would literally cook itself. It was a disposable design, made for bursts of extreme performance rather than endless life. Behind the turbine was the real torch. The afterburner was a giant pipe where raw fuel was dumped into the exhaust and ignited for a massive boost of thrust. The R-15's afterburner was primitive but devastatingly effective. It had a series of fuel manifolds and flame holders simple metal rings that kept the fire stable even at supersonic speeds. When lit, it turned the exhaust into a white-hot plume stretching almost 10 meters behind the jet. At full afterburner, each R-15 produced over 22,000 pounds of thrust. Two engines together gave the MiG-25 more than 45,000 pounds of raw thrust. That was enough to launch the Fox Bat from a runway straight into the thin air above 65,000 feet in minutes. But it came at a cost. The afterburner burned fuel so fast that the MiG could empty its tanks in less than 45 minutes of flight. And because the nozzle was just steel with no fancy cooling, it glowed bright orange after a few minutes at top speed. And once you had the firepower, the next challenge was putting it all together. The R-15 was built for mass production. Each major part, the compressor drums, the turbine modules, the afterburner rings, was made separately in Soviet factories and shipped to the Tumansky plant for final assembly. Technicians stacked the compressor stages one at a time on the long shaft. 
checked the alignment with optical tools, then bolted the two turbine stages at the rear. Finally, they attached the enormous afterburner can with hundreds of bolts and rivets. There were no digital simulations, no laser measurement tools. It was mostly manual assembly using jigs and fixtures, but it worked because the tolerances were intentionally simple. The engine was not supposed to be a perfect Swiss watch. It was supposed to be a hammer. Once assembled, each engine was mounted in a concrete test cell. Technicians ran it at idle, then mid-power, and finally slammed it into full afterburner. If it survived the test, it was declared fit for a MiG-25. On the test stand and in the air, the R-15 proved it was pure muscle. With both engines in full afterburner, the MiG-25 could climb to 65,000 feet in under 5 minutes. It could cruise at Mach 2.8 for long enough to intercept a target and then turn for home. Pilots could push it to Mach 3.2 in a straight line, but they knew it would probably destroy the engines. Turbine blades would stretch, crack, or even break off if you stayed that fast too long. The flight manual specifically warned pilots not to exceed Mach 2.83 unless it was an emergency. Of course, test pilots sometimes ignored that just to see what the Fox Bat could really do. The result was world records. In 1977, a specially modified MiG-25 climbed to 123,000 feet in a near-ballistic arc. Another set a world speed record at Mach 3.2. The R-15 was a time bomb, but it delivered. But why did this engine exist at all? To understand that, you have to go back to the height of the Cold War. The United States had the U-2 spy plane, flying higher than any Soviet interceptor. Then came the SR-71 Blackbird, cruising at Mach 3 and outrunning every missile. The Soviet Union needed a jet that could match it. The Mikoyan Design Bureau was ordered to build an aircraft that could reach Mach 3, climb beyond 65,000 feet, and destroy any intruder. Sergei Tumansky's team didn't have the time or resources for a revolutionary design. They scaled up an existing turbojet, making it simple to build and powerful enough for short bursts of extreme speed. The MiG-25 first flew in 1964 and shocked Western intelligence. When a pilot defected to Japan in 1976, engineers saw a crude but brilliant machine. It was not elegant, but it did exactly what it was meant to do. Remember the question earlier? At full throttle, how much fuel do you think the MiG-25 burned in just one hour? So, the answer for that is, at full throttle, Pilots reported the MiG-25 burned fuel faster than a Boeing 747 at takeoff, roughly an estimated 18,000 liters in just one hour. That was enough to drain its tanks in under 45 minutes. It was inefficient and rough, but it worked. The Tumansky R-15 was never meant to be elegant. It was built for one purpose, to give the Soviet Union an interceptor that could outrun anything in the sky. And it succeeded, forcing the West to rethink high-speed aircraft. Which would you rather see next? The SR-71 Blackbird's J-58 engine or the Concorde's Olympus 593? Tell us in the comments and don't forget to subscribe.